Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bit in between. Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, and particularly the bit in between. With your host, Barry Kirby. Welcome to this episode of 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. Everybody knows that um, I do have a, a bit of a background in politics and I do keep, but try and keep my, my work life and my hobbies um, separate. But sometimes something comes up where you just can't do that. And this is pretty much one of these times because the Welsh Government have just published, or just pu- published in, in the last week or so, a, a digital strategy for Wales. And whilst there's been digital strategies before we've seen from um, from UK government and, and elsewhere, this is one of the first that I've seen that has been predominantly putting the user at the centre of what they do. And so I'm really chuffed today to be interviewing essentially the, the minister who's been champion in this. And so I'd like to say a warm welcome to, to Lee Waters. Hi, Barry. Um, thank you, Lee, for taking the time out to do this. Obviously, we... As everyone will know, we are coming up to the uh, the election period and things like that. So I know that you're um, very busy trying to um, garner them votes. So I really appreciate you taking the time out to to have this discussion. I'm just uh, about to go to leaf sitting as soon as we finish talking. <laughs> <That's fair laughs> um, the uh, the, the rain's holding off, so that's um, obviously the, the election side. You've uh, you have spent a fair bit of time now involved in the um, in in the Welsh government. Um, could you just sort of Give us a brief overview about what your responsibilities have been and why it's sort of relevant to the digital side of things. Yeah, so I've been uh, in elected politics the last five years. I'm the Senedd member, as we call it, the member of the Welsh Parliament uh, for the Llanachie constituency, which, uh, as some of your listeners will know, is of South West Wales. Uh, and uh, for the last two years, I've been a member of the Welsh Government under Mark Drake for this First Minister, and I've been the uh, Deputy, Econ- Deputy Minister of the Economy and Transport, but with specific lead responsibility uh, for a couple of things, and, and one of those is uh, digital and AI. When you went to pick up that role as, as lead for digital and AI, is, is that, was it something that you were interested in, you wanted to, um, to follow up, or was it something that was lamped on you? No, no, I, I was very keen to get it because it's it's something that I've had a growing interest in, really. I mean, I have no background in it, but from a policy point of view, you know, it's, you know, it struck me uh, sort of seven or eight years ago, really, that this was, an, this was an area that we needed to get on top of. Yeah. And I guess the through the through COVID and stuff as well, we've, we've had an increase in reliance on, on digital tools as well. So I guess never has it been more prominent that... Uh, that we need to get on top of these things or on more on a day-to-day basis than we ever have done. It's certainly become a lot more visible for, sh- for sure, uh, but I think there's still a huge uh, degree of uh, mist and mystery and ignorance uh, and embarrassment around around digital in its broadest sense. People don't know what it is. And what I've been trying to do is to try and mainstream it as a tool for solving problems. You know, I'm not interested in the tech really. Tech is a means to an end. I, you know, the, the conversation I've been trying to believe is, is what is its public purpose and why is it relevant as a key, as a mainstream part of policy, not as a backroom function, but as a boardroom function. Now, leaders need to understand this and they need to use it to achieve broader goals. And I think, um, hopefully, many, many uh, listeners to this podcast, that'll be sort of music to their ears, because it's certainly music to my ears, that um, <clears throat> that whole technology being a means to an end is an absolutely um, a vital thing because unless it's been employed properly in a way that um, people can actually use it and it, it solves day-to-day problems yeah. then then you otherwise you just do technology for technology's sake sure um, we, we touch on sort of the COVID-19 piece How have you found working through COVID-19 because obviously it's, it's put um, a different reliance on being able to engage with people and which is I guess your your bread and butter as it were how, how have you managed working through COVID? Well, I guess I got sort of two different roles which intersect. One is as a local Senate member uh, representing people and being c- connected to what's going on in my patch. And the other is a minister for the whole of Wales. Uh, and uh, two, uh, the two have been very intense um, uh, and 
but slightly different, I guess. Uh, and I'm very lucky in my Senate member role to have a, to have a small, very hardworking team uh, based in the area who have been um, working throughout. I've done a lot of social media engagement. So I've, you know, I've, something I've always done, but I think it's been particularly important during COVID to, to, and to, be, to be visible, uh, to be engaged, and to be honest, and that, and that's what I I think has been important, and that has taken a huge amount of energy whilst trying to do everything else. To you know, so I use Facebook a lot, and I engage directly with people. I don't I see it as a, not as a broadcast tool, but as an engagement tool. So I make you know a big effort to 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 go back and forth with people, um, and that I think that has been appreciated. But that's that's taken a lot out of me personally, emotionally, uh, and then these are sort of the ministerial stuff that has been just incredibly intense. Because you know, Teams and Zoom are fantastic tools that a year ago nobody had really heard of. Yeah. Um, but it is literal back to back. You know, I wake up, I go to my laptop. I'm sure like you and your colleagues, and I I pretty much stay there part of a brief jog uh, until eight o'clock at night, and it's that's just draining really. Yes, it's um, yeah. I think there's been recent papers come out talking about sort of Zoom fatigue and um, and things like that which i think it's it's interesting isn't it because lots of people have been been saying oh we you know we can do so much now from home um how do you see that balance working in the future because um i guess from my perspective i see that um yes i'm not having to travel everywhere has been brilliant because a you say you save money on commuting for for one at a really basic level you're yeah. you're not contributing to um um the environmental issues etc cetera, etc cetera. But the this sort of interaction, because obviously we're recording this on Teams at the moment, it isn't a, it still isn't quite the same as us being in the same room, maybe having a, have a doing this discussion over a pipe, for example. Sure, and it opens up possibilities, doesn't it? And it closes down others. I guess the, that's the that's the nature of it. Somebody said to me the other week that it's not so much working from home, it's sleeping in the office. That's <laughs> 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 quite good. Uh, but this does cr cross over with another of my policy interests and ministerial responsibilities around sustainable transport and tackling climate change. So we've set a target as a Welsh government beyond the pandemic of keeping uh, remote working, as we're calling it, at, at a 30% level. It was 40% during the first wave. We think 30% is a reasonable success, steady state um, level to aim for. And looking at what opportunities that throws up. So, for example, uh, not far from you, uh, there's a country park called Hinchech Owain, where we've invested in the visitor centre and we're creating a co-working space there. So people can, instead of commuting from cross hands into Cardiff or Swansea, they can get away from their kitchen table, work in a in a place and be have access to nature in the in the lunch hour. So it, similarly we're hoping to set up hubs in town centres because obviously the retail model has collapsed. Uh, and can we use this as a way of bringing people back into town centres, which creates a social experience but also enables them to have an ongoing meaningful role. So so you know there are there are there are possibilities from this change which are positive, but there are real negative dangers as well. And they're acutely aware of the equalities aspect of this. You know, if you are a victim of domestic violence, working from home is a very bad thing. Um, so, you know, we need to step very carefully through, I think, this minefield this is thrown up. But but overall, properly managed, I think it could be a force for good. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, actually. the um, I think getting it is going to be tough getting the balance right, but I get, you don't know till you try. Mm -hmm. um, and it will throw up issues. So again, from a human factors perspective, there's simple things like how do you work ergonomically from home? How do you make sure you've got, you know, in, in the office where you all have to do um, display screen equipment assessments and make sure that everything's at the right height and you've got all the right things, we, which we don't do at home because I've even got colleagues who've been working off ironing boards and things like that, which is, you could sort of see for a couple of months at the start of the pandemic, but now we're in a different phase where actually this is going to be the new normal or whatever it is going forward. We need to support workers um, better in that respect and allow employers to um, support their workers, but without it being too intrusive. So I think it we'll see me, how that evolves. It took me 10 months to figure out I needed to get my office chair delivered to my house. And uh, so I was just sitting in a normal crappy kitchen chair and it was you know, yeah. taking its toll. And, and that, that has made such a difference. It does. It's, it's one of these things that you don't uh, necessarily... Um, realize that the value of until until it's gone and i guess we also thought you know that this covid thing hopefully will be over quite quickly um and we'll we'll be back to normal so we 
it's all very temporary, whereas now it's it uh, is becoming just, more permanent. Yeah, uh, that's right. I, you know, it, they, it, that's just the wrong lens, I think, isn't it? This idea yeah. that you know this is a I know it's such a cliche, isn't it? There is a new normal. The, certainly, the old normal is gone, yeah. uh, and it's that you know we're in that interregnum. You know, the the old the old is dead, but the the new is not quite yet born, and we're you know and that's exciting because we can shape it. But it's it's definitely a different paradigm. You are listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. We wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support. You can help further by rating us through your podcast provider, sharing us through social media, and telling your friends and colleagues. Let's work together in raising awareness of the value in putting users at the center of what we do. Also through this, you've had a very um, another interesting challenge here. Is you've got a, you've been part of a team um, that's had to make some very serious decisions um, about you know how the the Welsh government and Wales is going to tackle various elements of COVID. How have you been able to work as a team and make them decisions yet be all remote from each other? Have you found it, it's created a different dynamic? Have you found different issues or? Well, we've certainly met together as a group far more than we did before as a group of ministers. There's a, there's a dozen Welsh ministers led by Mark Drifford, the first minister. And, you know, he has been uh, excellent, really, at involving everybody. So even though I am a deputy minister and technically not part of the cabinet, you know, you wouldn't really know that from the meetings. So everybody wow. has a seat at the table and everybody is, is equal, really, as part of the discussion. And, you know, I am, uh, by nature, somebody who likes to challenge uh, and you know, I've you know I've had I've had my head really. You know, I've been allowed to to push and to ask the awkward questions and to to be difficult really. And that's been uh, that's been a good process, I think. You know, we are I think we have been a science led government. So we're not you know we meet every day as a cabinet, um, and you know we don't do it from a blank sheet of paper. We have in front of us a set of recommendations from the chief scientific officer, the chief medical officer, and our and our scientific advisory cell. Uh, who you know have have proven to offer wise counsel. So in a sense, we're given a series of propositions, and then we test those propositions. Um, so it's been a it's been a extraordinary period. Clearly, and the other thing I've had specific responsibility around is making sure that our PPE suppliers are mm-hmm. secure and steady. So in, you know, in the middle of all that last summer, we were meeting. I was meeting daily with a cross-sectional team from central and local government, just to keep on top of that. And that was a that was a very intense experience. Again, daily teams meetings, uh, just scrutinising where the weak points were, and that's created. I've just had my last meeting with them this week, and it was quite, I was quite emotional. I actually cried <laughs> saying goodbye to them because it had been a real, you know, in, in through the furnace, you you form a real bond with a group of people, with a, you know, with a sense of common purpose. Um, so, in terms of the broader COVID stuff, you know. We take it seriously. You know, these are huge decisions. And because, as I said earlier, I engage a lot with people in my local area through social media. I, you know, I'm getting a real, real time live feedback from people uh, of their concerns, their reactions, their confusions, um, their struggles. And that, you know, that in a sense has given me a sort of an open feedback loop between that day to day interaction with people it's affecting and being in the room that makes the decisions. Uh, so that's been, you know, that's been fascinating, really, but exhausting and emotionally draining. And 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 also, you know, I think very humbling, because I think you have to enter it with a view of, I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah. Uh, uh, and none of us will know, only in hindsight will, will, we have, will we say that we've made the right decision. So, you know, hubris has no place in this room. Uh, you know, we need to be open to the fact that we're doing this wrong and be willing to change our minds uh, and accept the limit of our knowledge and be, and be willing to challenge each other. I think that's really important. No, it's, really, it's really fascinating to get into, I guess, the background, because obviously we see the, um, the deci- you know, the outcome of the decision, the outcome of that process um, on TV and stuff like that. But it's really fascinating to hear about it from inside the room, as it were. Well, there was a really good just fly on the wall documentary done by S4C, which is available on the on the iPlay. It's in Welsh, but with full subtitles, which followed Mark Drake for the round for six months. And it captured. I hadn't realised they were filming this, but it captured all the the cabinet meetings. And you know, you can hear us having these having these arguments. It's it's well worth a watch on 
uh, on iPlayer. It's called, uh, if you type in Mark Drake for the new iPlayer, I'm sure it'll come up. And um, I'll find that and put a link to that in the um, in the podcast podcast description. Um, so to go to actually the 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 main chunk of um, of what I wanted to talk about, which is which is this digital strategy that you've um, mm. that you've led um, or sponsored. Um, what is the digital strategy, and why is it important? What what what, is, what, what were you trying to achieve? Well, a number of things, really. Uh, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, I think you know the profile and knowledge of digital needs to be raised. Uh, and uh, as ever in in, in any uh, organization or society, there is there is existing excellent practice, but there are also large pools of mediocrity which just are untouched by because they're good practice. Yeah. Uh, and if and I think the, in the, without the plan, without the strategy, you're going to allow that unevenness uh, to get worse, really. So mm-hmm. I was, you know, I, I've, as I say, I've come to this uh, uh, over a long period, but I've, but I've increasingly since becoming elected, seen this from a couple of different angles. So when I got the chance in government to grab hold of this, I, I was determined that we were not going to just keep buggering along. We needed to try and attack this as a whole system. Okay, that's... Um... I mean that's really good, and as I said from the um, the introduction, I mean one of the things I was really interested in was the fact that um, you've got a major emphasis, even even in the foreword that you've written for it, in in putting the user first. Yeah. Um, I mean that's something that's quite close to my heart um, as a as a human factors practitioner. Um, why do you think we? I guess. Why do you think we haven't done this before? And I talk about governments as a whole, because even even when you look at uh, UK government, all the way down to like sort of local government, um, I mean, I, I get exasperated at seeing you know local government websites that um, that all look very pretty, but when you just want to find out you know what the user journey is that you want to do, like I want to find out when what, what bin's being collected this week, sure. you can never find it. So, what give you that emphasis, that drive to to really look at the user? Well, two two things really. One was sort of uh, policy based, and one was human based. So before I became elected, I ran a small uh, Welsh think tank called the Institute for Welsh Affairs, and we did a project with ten of us, the cancer charity, a crowdsourcing policy project. And I was really keen to try and use crowdsourcing for policy development, um, uh, and we did it. Uh, called, it was called Let's Talk Cancer. Uh, and it was fascinating. So I did it with a with a with a sort of a, a bunch of people, sort of cancer experts and health experts, uh, and digital people. And we th- what we thought it was going to throw up didn't end up throwing up at all. So right. we thought we thought that w- what the crowd would tell us was uh, we want better access to new drugs, we want shorter waiting lists. That's what we were anticipating. And actually, what came back was uh, about user experience. So they didn't call it that, but that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was, you know, we want text messages. If our appointments change, we want access to patient notes. Uh, we want, uh, you know, real time information. So it was about that patient journey rather than about clinical outcomes. Fascinatingly, so that really sort of uh, was it was unexpected and it was a penny drop moment for me, really. And then I went through the process of trying to talk to. Uh, NWIS, as it's called, which is the National Welsh Informatics Service, which is the digital arm of the NHS in Wales, about trying to implement how would you do these things. And, you know, the dysfunction of our system became very apparent very quickly. So that was the, sort of the policy side. And then the personal side, my son uh, was seeing a consultant regularly, and we had to take him out of school to drive 30, 40 minutes to school, and he found the journey really difficult. Uh, and I kept saying to them, this is crazy. Why, you know, you could do this over Skype. Why wouldn't you let us just Skype into this meeting? And they just said, oh, no, we're not allowed to do that. Well, why? And there was never a satisfactory explanation or patients' confidentiality and information security. So, well, just this is nonsense. Uh, so so those two things were in my head as I, as I became a, an assembly member. And then I joined the Public Accounts Committee and kept hitting up against this informatics problem. And so one, the first inquiry we did was with the quality of hospital food. And the system's response was, well, we need to digitize the nurse recordings 
system. And that's taking seven years to do. Every project involving NHS Digital was taking seven years to do. Uh, and so we launched an inquiry into, into NHS that I was kind of the lead sort of, uh, investigator on, I guess, I suppose you, you would call it. Uh, and, you know, very uh, systematically came across a whole range of problems. And the report we did has been quite influential in changing that. And off the back of that, I was asked by a couple of ministers, because I was making a pain in the arse of myself, uh, <laughs> to, to lead an expert group to come up with some recommendations. And that, that we produced a report called System Reboot, which is available on the Welsh Government website. Some really good people. And we you know, collaboratively put together this report, which has become the bones for the for the digital strategy. And so, so user need and user experience and user design were at the core of that iterative learning process, really. Yeah, no, and, and that is absolute um, music to my ears, and and, and again in, in our community, that's because um, we that you know that, that's the day job, and just having that sort of drive and um, emphasis at, at this at the ministerial level, at the government level, has got to do nothing but good, um, because you're you're, set, you're setting the example, you're setting the lead. So it's, a culture, um, it's culture change, isn't it? That's what it's about. Absolutely. And 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 what I found fascinating about this is that I remember when I was on the committee, we had a chief executive of a health board in, uh, and what's you know this was a really good chief executive of a well performing health board, and I th what struck me was if I'd asked her about procurement, or I'd asked her about orthopedics uh, processes, she'd have ex been expected and would have expected herself to be able to answer that question. I asked her whether or not they were going to be going to cloud and where their information was stored, and she kind of. I would say embarrassedly giggled, she, she, but she wasn't even embarrassed to say, oh, I don't understand digital. And I thought, well, that's just extraordinary and intolerable, frankly, yeah. because yeah. the problem with that is people see digital as a set of technical functions, it's about IT, uh, and leaders need to see digital as an enabling tool for approaching old problems in new ways. And that's what I find exciting about digital. I'm interested in the citizen, I'm interested in public services being excellent because I believe in public services and public services competing in an era of Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, Google, where you have digitized end to end customer focused processes. And then, as you say, you go to your council website and try and find where the bins are. That disconnect of experience will profoundly undermine public services if, if we are not careful. You know, I remember coming across Babylon Health App for the first time where I could, if I had the resources, uh, see a doctor within 20 minutes on 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 my phone, have a recorded uh, note of it, nominate the, the, the chemist to have my prescription immediately delivered. And I contrasted that with my experience to see my GP, where I'd have to stay on the phone for 40 minutes in the hope that I'd be able to get through and then be given an appointment in two weeks' time. You know, this is this is my drive really here, Barry, is that will completely undermine public services because people will flock to the private sector option unless we make the experience of using public services as customer focused as the experience of using Amazon. This podcast is supported by K Sharp, the human science research and human factors consultancy. If you want to know how innovating in the relationship between humans and technology can add value to your business, product, or research, then visit www.ksharp.co.uk. The COVID experience, I think, has been really interesting because, you know, the drive to the, the going to see the doctor has now been, well, you can actually now have the, the remote um the remote experience, send some photos in of the problem and then make oh, an assess. Exactly. And what uh, before would have taken that process of getting every GP in Wales onto attend anywhere software previously under the system I described would have taken seven years. Yeah. And, and it was done in three weeks. Well, they do, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention until, yeah. I guess, until we pushed or somebody's driving that issue, then people are quite happy in many ways that they're comfortable in what they do. So you're, sure. it goes back to what you said earlier. It's we've got to have a, an appetite to change culture. Uh, which is really interesting. So, I think you know, one of the most influential, influential books I read on this was Mike Bracken's account of the creation of the government digital service, GDS. Mm -hmm. And the phrase he used was, this is not, um, it's not difficult, it's hard. Yes. And I think that's, that, that is the key thing to impress on public leaders. This is hard, but it's doable. Mm. But it's only doable 
if you make an effort to do it. And that's back to your question of why you have a strategy, why you have a plan. That's why, because we have to force people to confront this. We can't just leave it to organically develop. Yeah, no, absolutely right. So we, we need to be, um, we need to lead it, lead it from the front uh, yeah. and make it work. Um, obviously, they're, they're quite specific around the, around the strategy, but you've been involved or you've certainly seen, um, or been aware of you seeing sort of different technologies from like agriculture and things like that. What's what sort of smart technologies have you seen that have sort of inspired you, um, and what can Wales make more of? Well, I'm not that interested in the technology side of it, uh, because I think technology will will figure it out, and you right. know that's what that's what technologists are for. You know, I've got, I've got a, you know, a passing a passing interest in it. I've been particularly interested in the potential that LoRaWAN has. Uh, as a kind of mundane technology, really, you know, it's, it's, it's quite simple, isn't it? And pretty low tech, Laura yeah. One. But I, I, I'm more interested in the in the application of it. And I, I read a, one of those of the key books for me was, of, I don't know, seven years ago when it when it came out was uh, Alec uh, Ross, who was Hillary, Hillary Clinton's uh, technology uh, advisor, uh, brought a book out, which I, I thought was reading that was was a penny drop moment for me and his application to agriculture you know the agri-tech precision agriculture stuff i just think that it's got just got so much potential both for the world yeah. but also for an economy like ours in wales and our farming system uh, which is hasn't changed in you know 100 years uh, and just getting you know clear against the the the, the, th the ex existential threat of things like brexit which are upending business models finding a way of uh, making a different business model viable and productive is vital uh, and and simple technologies uh, have a have a have a role here but 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 more important i think it's the whole system pipeline so i'm interested in how can we apply technology to farm gates? How can we apply drones? How can we apply soil sensors? Uh, that's great. And that can help the farmer on the farm be more productive. But the really exciting bit, I think, is then the data, what we do with that data, how we harvest it, how we analyze it. And how can we do that? How can we create economic uh, potential and prosperity in a deprived communities like Wales through that? So why can't we in the local college in Kinehi be, be be teaching the data analytics and the and, and the software development to go along with that farm gate technology. And then why can't we in factories in Kinaki be building the robots and the machines necessary to to do the full circle? And I think that's, you know, that for me is is what I find exciting rather than the particular nuts and bolts of the bits of tech. No, that and that shows a real um end-to-end -end approach. Um like I said, the the old idea of if we can understand what the requirement is and fulfill the requirement all within the same basically local area then yeah. that that creates a real economy around it as well as um as well as fulfilling the needs and, so, and the, the thing i find really quite exciting about digital is the multidisciplinary team approach you know I, I, when i when i first came across the concept of a digital squad uh in centrica in in, in cardiff and then i read more about in, in this fund that was, was spotify was developing his problems and so on the idea you'd get of six or seven or eight i think it was multidisciplinary uh, functions together in one team and tackle a problem together. Yeah. I, I found, you know, that I think is brilliant. So in, in a sense, engineers will sort out the technology, but the engineers need to be tied to user need uh, and they need to be tied, you know, tied to the concept of iteration and problem solving and understanding the policy dimension of it too and bringing those things together in a team. That's what I find exciting about uh, digital because it's, again, this is a way of tackling an old problem in a new way. Because, you know, user research is not a new thing, no. uh, but public services, it's failed because public services don't use it. We do not, you know, I found in, in, in health very interesting, the systems concept of the user is the clinician, not the patient. Yeah. So, so how do we change that? We failed to change that in the conventional way. Well, digital gives us a chance to try again. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, it's that silo busting uh, team working multidisciplinary with the user at the absolute center. That's what I find genuinely exciting about the agenda. So you mentioned there about um, obviously delivering user needs and stuff. When you've developed your, your policies and the, the thinking that you're doing around the strategy, um, how, have you got, how have you managed to gather the views of residents in helping do this? 
in the strategy. So, uh, well, we did. Uh, so the way government works is in, there are strategy factories and they're, they're better at strategies than they are in actually delivering, because that's not where the skills and capacity lies at the, in the centre of government. Um, so we did. I, I was, as I said, the process I described. So I, I this was based heavily on a, on a report I'd done with a bunch of, sort of experts in the system reboot report. And I gathered them back together when I became a minister to say, right, what should we do next? Uh, so that was the that was the, sort of the start of it, really. And then, so it was it was sort of expert led, I would say. Mm -hmm. But then, what I was very keen on was to say, right, we've got a draft here. Normally, what would happen in government, we'd then just publish it. Yeah. Uh, but I said, well, let's let's publish it in draft, chapter by chapter, and crowdsource it, just as we had done with that cancer report uh, ten years ago. Um, and so that's how we try to engage with the citizen. But clearly that's imperfect because the citizen were not really, uh, uh, you know, it was the communities engaged in it and it's been a good process, but but you're not really getting your end user on that. I think I think the way I would answer that question, Barry, is what, what I want to do is to empower the citizen to design the services by user need. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the, the strategy once implemented will put the citizen in control. The, the citizen developing the strategy is is not something that we've figured out a way to do well yet, I think. And also, you know, bear in mind, we were doing this in the middle of the COVID crisis. <laughs> yeah. So you had, you know, everybody who wanted to be involved were also working 12 hour days doing doing other stuff as well. So it's, you know, it's so it has, you know, liberated. So back to the attend anywhere software example, it's definitely opened minds of the possibility of digital. And that's been very helpful because I was able to take this through at a time when suddenly other ministers' minds were opened up to that digital was a mainstream thing, not a niche, nerdy, pointy-headed thing. Yeah. Um, but it did also place constraints about you know, the ability of the system to to do its thing. So it's a huge tribute to the team in Welsh government and uh, the chief digital officer, Glyn Jones, and his team that they've been able to to get this to the point they have whilst also doing with everything else. If you are new to human factors and ergonomics, you might be wondering exactly what it is. In a nutshell, human factors is the study of how humans behave physically and psychologically in relation to particular environments, products, or services. As you will no doubt realize, that means human factors practitioners can add value to almost any project because they all involve people. The trick is getting that value as early in the project as you can because it ends up being much cheaper than fixing the issues later on. It's possibly one of the things that we haven't done um, as well as we could do um, all over um, is we, because residents themselves are a, a group of people that um, when you normally do product assessment or you bring users into a, a, an agile team or something like that, you're focused around something that brings them all together. But really all that brings residents together is we all live in the same place. They could be very, very diverse. Um, but also, you, Barry, you know, things you know on these of the the broader digital front, AI and the rest of it. You know, this is, goes back to the you know the Henry Ford quote, doesn't it? If you ask people in 1907, whenever it was, uh, what do you wanted, they'd want a faster horse. Uh, you know, yeah. things are so changing; people don't know what they don't know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, I, I'm not sure getting residents involved in designing uh, the the answer is is best i think getting residents involved to define the problem absolutely mm -hmm. and involving th them through an iterative process to make sure the answer works for them that's absolutely right but uh, but i think you know i think it's got to be a, a parallel part of a process rather than a, an outcome in itself yeah okay that's interesting so i guess another issue with i guess government um local national whatever is if residents are generally quite happy, you, you generally don't see them as much um, sure. unless you go and knock on the door. But if, if something's gone wrong, then that's when you that's when you see more people is when um, when they're disgruntled. Don't I so, know it? Pardon? Don't I know it? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, but with this type, with this sort of user-led approach, we traditionally were, you know, you go out and find out what, what the users want. Then you go back to them and say, does this fulfill what it is the what it is that you wanted? Does this fulfill the need? How are we going to do that at um, at a national level? How do how do we go back and make sure that the digital strategy, the digital tools and techniques that are coming out actually fulfil what it is that we want them to do? 
Well, because the digital strategy isn't an end in itself. It's about you know ripples of change through the system at a, at a service end. So one, of, so one of the things we've done, for example, I've done is to create something called a digital centre for public services, uh, which is initially going to be based in Ebbo Vale, but hasn't actually been in Ebbo Vale because we've all been working from home. Uh, but uh, a woman called Sally Meacham, who was involved with me in the expert panel, who has done a lot of digital leadership roles through uh, through government, including in GDS and DVLA and, and so on, is now the interim chief exec and chair of that. And that's about creating the doing capacity to help public services to transform. And that has three um, I am answering your question, honestly, but in a roundabout way. But, but that does a couple of things. One of that is about system leadership, uh, so that, which is really important. Creating a place where uh, you know the chief, we need chief digital officers in organisations. They're starting to organically come. So we've got one now in for local government in Wales. We've got one in Welsh government. We're about to have one for the NHS in Wales. Cardiff Council has one, uh, but but it's very uneven. So creating a place where the chief digital officers can come together and form an ecosystem. That's one function of it. The second then is around a standard setting, and that's that's re really important uh, with the with the chief digital officers. So we we this is the system I described when I reached. Uh, when I started on this in the committee, looking at the way the NHS was performing, is that and this is why it took seven years to do anything, was we we became hung up on this idea of a once for Wales solution. Uh, so we should, if we're going to do it, we should do it once, and we should do it once for the whole of Wales, uh, and that's a good idea. But the way that got translated into practice is that we moved at the pace of the slowest. Right. And because technology is moving so fast, by the time we got to the place where everybody was ready to go, the technology had changed. So we ended up huge investments in you know uh vendor dominated platforms that the the system had moved on but then we got to the point of implementing anything so we're trying to sort of redefine once for wales into not about uh that but about st about service standards so how you achieve those service standards you can innovate you can be different yeah. um but yeah. let's agree on what a service standard looks like and let's do that once for wales so i think the center's got a really important role in getting consensus in what those service standards uh, should be. It also has a really important role in hosting digital squads. So we've got two or three digital squads now working on different problems, with but out in the field in local authorities. There's one with the three local authorities, Turvine, Blenagwent and East Portalbert, on adult social care, mm -hmm. uh, where they're working with users, working with with people in the system at finding a way of doing user, user research, all the things you'd expect of changing the way people access adult social care to free up staff from not chasing call center inquiries into actually helping people and getting algorithms to do the boring stuff. Yeah. So that so that's that you know having somewhere that can be done is really important. And then the fourth thing it does is about best practice sharing and a knowledge hub. So I think that, you know, to your question of the of the role of the citizen and the customer and how you involve them, getting those changes in the system so the system itself is able to have those conversations with the system at the right lowest local level is important. I don't think it's something the Welsh government at the centre should be seeking to do itself. It should be changing the system so that the system does that itself at every point of interaction with the user. That's really, really interesting. And taking that, basically that agile approach and put it to the lowest com common denominator, which is, um, yeah, that could be really transformational. Um, so you've set um, an outline, you've set the vision, you've set the, the strategy. Um, what what do you what do you want to see happen as the next steps? Well, um, every, every, everything goes brilliantly. What what make you happy? Uh, well, it depends on the result of the election, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have published alongside, crucially, of the strategy a delivery plan. Uh, so you know, but, so this now becomes about implementation. It becomes system leadership, uh, and this is this is where it becomes hard because it's about breaking down silos and it's about sustaining momentum. And I guess what I've been trying to do is to set off dynamics within organisations that generate their own momentum and not to reliant on a minister at the centre pushing it. You know, the experience of, of GDS under the Conservative Coalition government with Francis Maud as a minister was that it did take a powerful minister to get permission for the Sherpas, as Mike Bracken called them, to, to, to see the system change through. So I know there is more to be done at a, at a central ministerial level, absolutely, to create the space to allow this to happen and to, and to push through the change. That definitely needs to happen. Whether I'm in the position to do that is in the hands of the good people of Hinnachin. So, but, 
but I hopefully through the creation of the digital center, the creation of the strategy uh, and an ex exciting people creating a buzz around it, which is definitely something the digital center has done. And so far the strategy is doing that I think is the best way, but this is, you know, as my old boss, Ron Davis once said about the evolution, you know, this is a process, not an event. Uh, and uh, it, it is something that needs to be driven through. That's why I think leadership, so one of the things the Digital Centre is doing is leadership training on digital and on user user needs. So chief executives and senior leaders, it's only a short sort of a couple of hours course, but explaining to them what user design is. Because yeah. um, that is that is really important. And back to that quote earlier of P Professor Kerry Morgan, which is about procurement, but applies to this, Digital belongs in the boardroom, not in the back room. And we've got to get leaders in all organizations to take their responsibility to understand, even though they personally may not be able to operate a spreadsheet or get this stuff. This needs to be one of the key tools their organization uses and gets good at to drive innovation and change and continuous improvement. I've got to say, it's absolutely fantastic to hear somebody at a... Um at a senior government level talking so passionately about um, the inclu user inclusion, human-centered design, um, and, and then tools and techniques. Um, hopefully, I think this will set not only a precedent for, um, for Wales in itself, and you'll have laid a, a, a really strong foundation um, for that moving forward, but it should be a really good example about what, what other governments can do to, to drive that sort of stuff forward. Um, I hope that, um, um, obviously, very selfishly, I, I hope that you uh, you're successful in Maine, then you can carry on this uh, this carry on this journey. Um, but I think you should be very um, very proud of the um, what you've achieved here, because I think it's phenomenal. Um, well, it's, a, it's a start, you know, it's a, it's an important start, but we've got to keep we've got to keep it going now. But it has to be owned, you know. It's, if it relies on someone like me at the centre being and making a pain in the arse themselves, then it's not going to work. This has to be owned by everybody, uh, and and I think the way to do that is by is by painting a picture of what success looks like, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and and everybody will come to this from their own point of view. And there's some people will, will do because they like the widgets. You know, for me, my burning passion on this is remembering the distress to my son, who couldn't get the system to meet his needs. And, and understanding the importance that public services continue to play in society. And if they don't get this agenda, they will be uninvented. Lee, thank you ever so much for giving up uh, an hour of your time, an hour off the doorstep. Um, I really, really appreciate it. All the best for the, um, for, for the campaign and the, uh, the run-up to the election. And hopefully we'll catch up again um, afterwards. Diolchen fawr Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us at www.barrykirby.co.uk and on Twitter at B-A-Z underscore K. See you next time. And remember, it's more than just common sense. Listening to 1202, the Human, the Human Factors, Factors podcast. podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next See time. You next and remember, it's more than just common sense.